Welcome to our live stream today on beekeeping at Monticello. Uh, today is World Bee Day, and we're celebrating the holiday today with our friends Paul Legrand and Leslie Boudery, who are volunteer beekeepers at Monticello. Today they'll be talking about the bees at Monticello and telling us a little bit more information about this endeavor. Um, let us know where you're joining from in the comments, and please put your comments for Leslie and Paul in the, and please put your questions for Leslie and Paul in the comments as well. So Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Um, Paul Legrand, I have um, been a beekeeper here since I started the process back in uh, the spring of 2010. Uh, and I had previously been up in New York State and spent roughly 20 years of being a beekeeper and 50 miles north of New York City. And uh, I have enjoyed it thoroughly here. We have gone from four hives at one location to, well, actually at this point, we have four locations and roughly 60 hives. Now, two of them are not on site. One of them is at Highland and one of them is at New Roots Farm, which is uh, uh, International Rescue Committee sponsored gardens uh, about 10 miles to the uh, west of here. But it's, um, it's one of those things where I find it's very enjoyable to, uh, to do this, it's very relaxing. It seems hard to believe it's relaxing, but it is, it focuses your attention because the bees always have a way of telling you if you're not paying attention. And um, that is uh, something to consider. Now the, the bees themselves, <clears throat> if they did sting you, they would die unlike yellow jackets, which is another topic for another time. So I think that uh, I could also suggest we Listen to Leslie talk about her experience here. Okay, thank you. My name is Leslie Lambor Boudery, and I'm delighted to be with you for World Bee Day. Um, and I am uh, a, a native of New Orleans and lived in Washington, D.C. for many years. I'm an educator by profession, and while in D.C., I worked in the field of museum education. My husband and I moved here in 2010, and um, I'm currently serving as um, an independent consultant specializing in uh, antique ceramics. So I serve as the visiting curator of ceramics at James Madison's Montpelier, a visiting scholar at Colonial Williamsburg. And I also help here at Monticello with some programs and with the bees. So it is really tremendously rewarding. So I'm quite excited to be part of the bee effort. And, and uh, I came in through the back door to beekeeping, I will say, because um, Paul and his wife, Mary, moved uh, to Charlottesville just before my husband and I, the couples became fast friends. And once I learned that Paul was a beekeeper, I inundated him with questions. And uh, he invited me to help with the honey harvest and the bottling. And I think my pestering him with questions prompted him to invite me into the bee yards to assist. And I have been there ever since. So. For six years, I have been uh, the associate beekeeper here at Monticello and uh, Highland, and it is it is a tremendously rewarding endeavor. We we thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, so, with that said, let us show you a video. Uh, we have a brief video which will provide an overview about the uh, beekeeping here at Monticello. Paul Legrand, I'm the beekeeper here at Monticello, and I've been doing it now for. 12 seasons here at Monticello. Um, this is my 31st season as a beekeeper, and uh, I love it, it's my passion. Along with volunteer associate uh, beekeeper Leslie Boudery and additional volunteers, we have initiated bee yards and cared for honeybees at Monticello since the spring of 2010. We started with uh, four hives at Monticello uh, in the uh, spring of 2010. Then two years later, we added six here at Tufton. Meanwhile, increasing the numbers at Monticello, the uh, Monticello hives are about a mile and a quarter from here. Right now we have uh, 22 full hives. We also have starter hives called nukes. We will take hives that look like they're getting overcrowded and remove frames from them and put those frames in called splits or nukes. And that leaves plenty of extra surplus room in the old hive also allows the new hive to generate a queen. What we try to do is prevent swarms by making our own artificial swarms. It's a way for people to build up their population of hives. 
And the best thing about it is that you're using localized climate familiar bees, which I think makes a big difference. You, you buy bees from Hawaii or California or Georgia, different climates, and they may not adapt well. We try to produce a lot of honey. That's one of the objectives here, in addition to the pollination for the flowers at the Center for Historic Plants. And uh, we seem to have a pretty good success rate most years. And this, this past year was, was no exception. I believe we had at least 60 gallons of, uh, of honey. So that's quite a bit of honey. When you look at a one pound jar, that's 12 ounces of fluid ounces of honey in it. And they, they sell out very quickly. It's extraordinary. Uh, it has everything to do, I think, with the Russian bees and the type of equipment we use and being very diligent. We have reached our, more or less, our physical capacity. What you see is, uh, is probably going to be the final products. Uh, no extra bee yards around here. If we start to put too many hives in, the bees will actually start to uh, have to compete against themselves to get the nectar and the pollen and the, the honey take will actually decline. So there's a limit to how much we can do. We've also got a point where we've done one of the objectives that I wanted to do when we first showed up here, and that was to repollinate the whole region. And uh, we've done that. Uh, we have a lot of bees that are successful and they're living in the trees now uh, on their own. We've also been very fortunate. We've had very healthy bees during this time period and it's a much healthier environment than when I showed up 12 years ago. So, how did we get here? How do we go from four hives to 60 hives? It was, uh, quickly I could say it was through hard work and uh, one of the things we may stress here today is beekeeping is uh, a very rigorous process. Uh, there are many people who like to get involved with beekeeping because it's the right thing to do because it helps pollinators and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as my former um, bee mentor told me 30 years ago, even before I started, that they wanted me to become a beekeeper, not a bee haver. And I asked, What's a bee haver? A bee haver is somebody who says, oh yes, we have some hives in the back somewhere. They may have been dead now for a year. And the irony is that people who are bee havers make matters worse because you end up with bees dying off, um, having from diseases that are picked up by healthy bees in the area. And we're gonna see a little bit later a picture of a feral hive on the uh, Monticello property. And those are the types that we want to encourage to develop. Because when I first came here, there were very few bees on the, the uh, flowers at the gardens. And this is one of the things we talk about in Monticello. And I realized that they had the same problems here as I had up in New York State. And that's how I came around to proposing to start, maintain, and fund some beehives. At the time, I didn't know they had a problem with bears, so that was an extra expense with electrical fencing, but that's another story. Uh, the point of it, though, is that uh, the hard work has paid off. With uh, knock on wood, so far, had very, very, very low losses uh, every winter. And uh, in fact, we've had five uh, highs we've lost over the course of the last six seasons, which is, uh, well, put that in perspective, it's under 3%. And compared to around the country, that runs between 30 and 40% and or more. In fact, one year we lost no hives, and the state lost 60% of all hives. So we've been very fortunate with that. Yes, and, and Paul, you make a very good point about beekeepers and bee havers. I think that it's, it's always helpful if we can make an analogy. If you think of bees as livestock, you know, you would not decide to have a herd of dairy cattle because you wanted to have milk or 
a, a yard full of chickens because you wanted to have eggs, you would realize that you were going to be investing in these animals and that you were responsible for their care, for their well-being, and for their health. And that is a year-round responsibility. And it's the same thing for beekeepers. So our bees here at Monticello are livestock. We have millions of bees here, but they are counting on us to provide the uh, oversight and the attention because this is a managed environment. And so as beekeepers, we have a lot of responsibility. We have to make sure that they have appropriate shelter, that they are protected with bear fences, as Paul has mentioned, that we are sure that they are healthy. So that involves um, pest management and involves medication. And so there is a lot that goes into it. It is a year round endeavor and beekeepers are truly dedicated to the task at hand. Now, our role is to make, keep the bees as healthy as possible so that they can do their jobs. So the bees that are living in a hive, um, and at peak season, you have about 50,000 bees in each of the hives that you saw on the video, and it's several stacks of um, equipment and they live within. And this is the perfect homework environment because the hive is the home of the bees, but it is their factory as well. And you have factory workers, the female bees in the hive are known as the workers, and indeed they do all the work. There is one queen who is the mother of all of the bees in the hive. And seasonally we have male bees in the hive and their role is simply to um, mate with the queen so she can produce more workers for the factory. And it's a very seasonal endeavor. And I think that's important to note too. Right now we are in peak season. The hive is just bursting at the seams, filled with workers. These bees are out foraging, gathering nectar and making honey. So honey production is really ramped up right now. You need a lot of workers in the hive. As we get later in the year where there isn't quite enough nectar or, or much uh, less nectar flow, we don't need as many factory workers. So the hive is going to diminish in population. And then we're going to have what are known as winter bees. And these are bees that are anatomically a bit different. They have more fat in their abdomen and their role is going to be to protect the queen through the winter. So just like the elves at the North Pole or the workers in the uh, Easter egg factory, you have seasonal populations with lots of workers. And then when it's not peak season, you just have a few workers. But regardless of the number of workers in a hive, it is the responsibility of the beekeepers to ensure that they are safe and strong and well-fed and well-maintained. And this is where the beekeeping responsibilities come to the forefront. Um, and as Paul mentioned, it is, it is a passion. It is a wonderful endeavor, tremendously rewarding, but it is also very physically demanding and it is a year round endeavor as well. So uh, we, we do enjoy it. Um, Paul, maybe you could talk a bit about um, the seasonal nature and some of the seasonal chores and uh, the different different jobs that some of the beekeepers do. First of all, I would say that um, think of us as, as farmers. We have a crop that uh, comes into fruition in a six, sometimes seven or eight week period. And the rest of the year, our job is to keep the bees alive so there'll be enough crop next year. And that requires work throughout the year. Obviously, during the, uh, the spring, late winter, spring, especially here in this part of the uh, country, it starts early and it continues right into July, August, and then it starts to pair off a bit. And then we have the fall flowering plants that come out and the bees start to ramp up population again a little bit and uh, for one final move. And they're also focusing on the creation of these winter bees which I call the secret service bees because their only job is to make sure the queen makes it to the spring. That's their only job. They don't defend the hive. Well, I guess they would if you take the top off, but they don't defend the hive. They don't go out and forage. This is nothing to forage. Uh, they rely on what they have stored in their hives, which is a mistake that a lot of uh, introductory beekeepers make, which is to go out and underfeed them or take some of the honey that they need 
and the uh, beekeeper keeps it. And so they end up starving to death, especially in the end of the winter time, which is one of the most dangerous times for them. So, um, yeah, so that's the kind of, there's a lot of a lot of work that goes into it, and um, as Paul mentioned, it the bees are working seasonally, but the beekeepers, the volunteer beekeepers, we're all working seasonally as well. So during this time of year, we are working to um, ensure that the hives are not overcrowded, and there are many ways to do that, and working toward the honey harvest, and so on and so forth. As we get later in the year, we'll be looking at pest management, we'll be looking at medication and so forth. And even in the winter months, there is so much to be done because all of the bee yards have to be maintained year round. And all of the equipment has to be maintained year round. And so we have different volunteers who kind of specialize in different roles as beekeepers. And, um, and I would say we have a pretty good team, wouldn't you? Well, we definitely have a very good team because uh, we have very conscientious helpers. Uh, but to put some numbers behind it, uh, it's, I know that I, I put in over 800 hours a, a year and Leslie at least 400 because she's also in Williamsburg and Montpelier doing other ventures. And I, uh, I know our other volunteers put in another 400 or so. So we're really looking at approaching 2,000 hours of volunteer effort. And it's, it's not glamorous. And um, especially in uh, June, July, and August in a bee suit. Uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's a fact of life. Um, one of the things I do want to talk about, however, is how did we get here? Why are, why are we been successful? And part of that has to do with when I approached Monticello, I had been reading up on the success rate of bees throughout the country. And one of the things that most people don't realize is the bees are not native to this hemisphere. They were brought here by the English and they uh, brought a, a called the Northern European bee. It's a European species. And that was okay, but they were de disease resistant uh, or not disease resistant rather. And it was very difficult to maintain them. In the uh, early 1860s, the Italian bees were brought here gentle, disease resistant, produced a lot of honey. And it was at the same time that we had inventions that are still being used today. Langstroth highs. These are those highs where they pull the frames out and so you can reuse it. Prior to that, people would destroy the hive to get to the honey and the bees in the process. Uh, that was followed by uh, bees from Australia or from Austria and uh, Yugoslavia, uh, Carniolan bees. And there were some from the uh, Caucasus mountains. They all are different subspecies of the uh, European bee. But the ones that we use are from Russia originally, from Eastern Siberia. And they had gone out there because the owners, the serfs were sent there by the czar to fight uh, or to populate an area of uh, Eastern Siberia that the uh, Japanese and Russians were fighting over back in the early 1900s. And that produced, uh, the introduction of the bee mite, which had been with another type of species of bee that is the, called the Asian bee that had developed a resistance to it. Well, the European bees had never seen it before and they, they must have lost 80 to 90% of their bees. But the, the survivors had adapted and they're still there now. In fact, the Department of Agriculture, when we were faced with this problem with bee mites sweeping the rest of the world, and I questioned, what took it so long, that how do we fix this? And they thought about bringing Russian bees over. And they don't mix terribly well with the Italian bees and they lose their resistance. But if you can try to keep the Russian bees separate, you have the success rates that I discussed. And commercial beekeepers are now coming back around to that because trying to run a business where you're losing 40% of your stock every year is a hell of a way to, to make a living. So that's, that's kind of where we are now. Well, I think that it's important to, uh, to mention the Russian bees. They have provided, you know, very good livestock for us. They are well adapted to the area. They are gentle and they have thrived here in Virginia. But I do want to give Paul credit too, because he is a very vigilant, vigilant and uh, diligent 
beekeeper. And so he is in the hives, he is uh, in the bee yards rather, almost every day, making sure that everything is going well. And then he calls on the team so that we can help however we need to, whatever needs to be done. So he mobilizes the troops so that we can be very good, attentive beekeepers. And it is that year round effort, collaborative effort, I think, that vigilance that has contributed in many ways to the success of the, uh, of the Monticello effort. So it's been very, very rewarding and I think very um, beneficial to the, to the area, both uh, you know, the ecology and the environment as well with the pollinators. So, so I think this is a good time. I think we've kind of given you a, a bit of an overview and perhaps we can um, take a few questions from the audience. Yeah, um, great. So you talked a little bit about the Russian honeybees and species you use. Can we can we skip ahead and talk a little bit about swarms? Mm -hmm. What exactly are swarms and why do beekeepers not want their hives to swarm? Oh, gosh. Well, swarms, you know, the word swarm, people tend to panic when they hear the word swarm and they think of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds or something. Uh, and the word swarm is merely a, uh, a synonym for uh, basically overcrowding. And there's nothing to fear from a swarm. It is a natural phenomenon where the population in the beehive has just gotten too crowded. And so the bees make a command decision that, well, we need some new real estate. And so we are going to find a new place to live. Some of, us, some of the family can stay behind, but the rest of the family, we're gonna find some new digs. They send out little scout bees and then about maybe 10,000 bees, the queen and about 10,000 bees will leave the hive. They'll have kind of a big cloud of bees as they're regrouping, they're communicating and trying to decide what's gonna happen. And then they move into a group and they can alight on the eaves of a house, on a fence post, on a bicycle. You might find a bee swarm almost anywhere, but it is not to be feared. The bees are merely in a bit of a holding pattern while they decide where they're going to find their final home. And Melanie, I believe we have a, um, a video of uh, both a feral beehive and a swarm. And uh, maybe we could show that and that would help to illustrate it. And I'll let Paul describe what's happening here. This is one of the things we would like to see is to repopulate the area with bees that basically are self-reliant. And what you're looking at is a tree on the property that was taken over by, I believe, Russian bees. And I say that because they went through the winter without, uh, and they went through the winter period, <laughs> which is, a, is an accomplishment. They, nobody paid any attention to them, nobody fed them, nobody gave them any, any help. They did it on their own. And um, this, this next part of it shows one of those swarms. Now it was easy, this one happened to be three feet off the ground. Um, we had, we had uh, verbal on it, but it was too windy, so we couldn't use that part. But you can see that sometime within two minutes it took to capture this group of uh, bees because they're all clumped together. We spray them with sugar water so they can't just fly off. They're not going to fly off unless the queen flew off with them. So they stay around the queen. You put them into the hive, you get the queen in the hive. If the queen goes in the hive, if it's good enough for mom, it's good enough for me. And they all go in. You can watch them marching in 20 abreast. It's pretty cool to see that. And uh, until you've actually seen it, you don't understand how impressive that really is. And one of the things I should also say though about swarms, swarms are a mark of success for the honeybee. Weak hives don't swarm. And this is the only way honeybees reproduce. So when you see them, it's not something to run screaming away. Um, I will add a little bit of the ginger to it. They are loaded with honey. And this is one of the things that beekeepers don't like about swarms. They're taking a lot of surplus honey with them. There's a unit of measure, a milligram, one thousandth of a gram. They will pack roughly 36 milligrams in their uh, honey, uh, stomach and they will need that to build from scratch a new hive. 
give you an idea how much that means, forgetting about what it actually is in ounces. The point is that if they had 30 grams, they could go 34 miles. So they've got 36 grams. It shows you how much they're going to have as a reserve. But the fact is they nearly never go 30 miles to a new hive location. They, they tend to move around a mile, mile and a quarter. But it also explains how they got across the United States. It took a long time for them to get to the West Coast. And that um, the, the Indians used to call them the white man's fly because they were actually ahead of the pioneers and the Indians loved the, the honey, but they knew they were gonna have some problems with the new uh, visitors to the country. Well, we do try to capture the swarms because as Paul said, this is a type of reproduction, but it means that a queen who is very successful and very prolific has decided to leave. And if she were not such a strong producing queen, there'd be plenty of room in the hive. So if we are able to capture a swarm and create a new hive here at Monticello with that strong queen, that's ideal. However, even if we don't catch the swarm and it goes into one of the trees somewhere in the geographic area, it's a plus for the environment as well because that strong queen will produce more bees for pollination. So it's, it, really is not a problem if we don't catch it. So, um, so there are benefits you know, to, to both. We sometimes um, try to intervene beforehand, before they swarm on their own, and it's called making a split. And what that does is that you capture some of these uh, bees and put them in these starter hives, these nukes, and hope that they will create a new queen as a replacement. I leave the old queen in the old hive. And more often than not, better than 50% of the time, they will generate a new queen when they realize they don't have a queen. And that leads to more hives. And uh, sometimes I've done that also to, uh, in case we were gonna lose hives. And that's one of the reasons we've got up to 60 hives now. We, we haven't, we've been fortunate in not losing hives, but we have to find more space for them. Hey, we have more questions coming in? Yes, we actually had a question from Jan watching at home. And Jan asks, if you have to keep the hive warm in winter. Well, what we use, and I started this 20 years ago, I switched to polystyrene hives. Up in New York State, we had a, a climate condition of uh, very similar to Albany, New York. And I found that we, I had been losing hives and I switched over to these as an experiment and I stopped losing hives. And those were all Italian bees. So it wasn't just a, a Russian uh, fan. And then I decided to bring them down here and use the uh, same type of uh, hive. And the thing about it is it's a thermos. <laughs> it, it keeps them a little bit warmer in the uh, winter time and it keeps them a little bit cooler in the summertime. And the, the temperature inside around the queen in the center of the winter cluster is in the very low 90s. However, the inside of the hive, the temperature may be in the mid 40s. <clears throat> and what they do is they, the cluster is continuously moving around where they're moving to the outside. The outside bees are coming in. There's a chain link to the, uh, the food and it uh, produces uh, well, that's how they consume their, their honey. And so the whole bottle goes up into the upper level of the, uh, the hive. And that's where people get in trouble because at some point it starts to get longer days and the queen stop, it had stopped laying eggs for the most part, will start to lay eggs. So they end up getting more and more bees and less and less food left. And so you have to pay attention to that. And that's what we do is different for most people. We have feeders on all winter long and we monitor them. And if the bees need sugar water, which is our primary source of feed, they get sugar water if they run out. And uh, if people don't have those feeders, they can't tell that their hive is out of food until they take the lid off and find out they, they have a dead hive. And that, that's another tidbit of, for them. So in thinking 
about bees. Um, why do they gather nectar and pollen? Okay, well that, you know, just as we have a pantry full of food, the bees need to have some staples in their pantry as well. So your pollen is going to provide the protein that they need and the, uh, the nectar that they turn into honey, that pro provides the carbohydrates that they need in their diet. So all during the, uh, the season where the flowers are um, in bloom and the trees are in bloom, the foraging bees will collect the nectar from all different sources, bring it back to the hive and uh, convert that into honey. And as it reaches the right consistency, they will cap that honey in the cells of the hive. And that actually just is their little pantry for the winter. Now, fortunately, the bees uh, will produce surplus honey. And as Paul said, we will take some of the surplus honey for, um, for our use, but we always are sure to leave enough in their pantry so that they will have what they need to get through the winter. And the upper box holds about 60 to 65 pounds of honey, which is more than enough for Virginia for the most times. Um, the other thing about the, uh, the, the importance of pollen is that is also a signal for the queen in terms of her egg laying. And as the pollen from the trees it disappears from the, uh, you know, the various trees or the flowers, they stop, it's a signal for her to cut back on her population laying. And they can go from 50,000 down to 25 to 30,000. And that is, um, it's an interesting way. It's, it's remarkable a bee with a pint size uh, brain collectively are, are pretty smart uh, creatures. Could you tell us a little bit about the honey? Like how do you gather the honey and what's that process for doing that? Okay. Well, um, it's, it's an art form. It also has to do with how fortunate the bees were. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. They, uh, Easter, I use this as an example in talks, those little bunnies, those things you chew. Um, if you're trying to sell those, you want to have those available a couple of weeks before Easter. Uh, it doesn't do you any good if you have them ready the week after Easter. Well, you need the, somebody to turn out the product. The equivalent is worker bees that are adults that are foraging. And when the worker bees last live only six to seven weeks. And the second half is when they're foraging. So you need a large population at the peak of the nectar flow to, to really produce the absolute best time for getting lots of honey. However, if it's raining, they can't fly in the rain. If it's raining during the daytime, they can't get, leave the hive. They can't navigate at night, so they're not out at night. So the only time they can do it is when the sun shines. Something about making hay and when the sun shines, I forget that phrase. Anyway, the point of it is that it's very possible that you could have a great nectar flow and a poor honey crop just because it rained or just because they didn't produce enough bees or just because there was too many swarms. Uh, uh, the state bee inspector study showed that they can have a good honey crop with one swarm they will not have a honey crop for the beekeeper if there are two. And if there are three swarms, and that's certainly possible in a hive, they won't have enough bees to make enough honey for them to make it through the winter time. Yeah. We've been very fortunate with the, uh, the honey production here at Monticello so that we are judicious about leaving the honey they need to get through the winter. But the surplus honey um, has really been a boon to our museum shop. So we have a few jars here. So it is available for sale uh, you know, in the museum shop as well as other products from the hive. The beeswax is used for a number of products. So you have lip balm and lotions and soap and all sorts of um, byproducts of the hive that are available in the museum shop. And it's another way you can support, support the effort. And uh, it's also, uh, available at the Heritage Harvest Festival. And that's a nice time to learn about the bees too. So um, 
the honey is is really special, and uh, we're very proud of the work that we do uh, with the bees to uh, to have the honey available for the population. So along those lines, Barbara asks if local honey is helpful for allergies. Can you talk about that? Well, I have heard that. You know, I have no medical background whatsoever. But I have heard that from many, uh, many different sources that if you do consume local honey, that it will help with allergies. But I have no medical basis for that. Matt, do you have any, any uh, further? Well, I was pre-med part of uh, freshman year in college, but I will go and say that, yes, the, uh, there is much to be said for that, for certain types of uh, allergies, for certain types of plants that happen to have the, uh, the nectar or the pollen then it will, it will produce uh, some, some good protection. Uh, but there are a lot of products that the bees create that are very healthy. And uh, there's, they have something called bee propolis, which is a cement that they make with their own secretions and also that from the resins of uh, pine trees and things of that nature that are used to seal the hive. Well, they're finding out that it's loaded with a, a antiviral properties. Royal jelly. Royal jelly is something that uh, all bees get two to three days worth, all workers and drones, and the queen gets 16 days worth. The queen lives five years, the workers live seven weeks. You want the royal jelly. And that also is jammed with the antioxidants and things of that nature. So yeah, so I've taken that now for nine years and I have not had a common cold since. So it's, it's, there's something to it. It'd be nice to see a study on that, but yeah. we'll see. That's another volunteer project for you, Paul. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I do have a question here from Bridget as well. Um, she's wondering if the beekeepers at Monticello ever work with the gardeners so that certain flowers are planted that create specific types of honey or for pollination reasons. Do you know anything about that, the plants here at Monticello? Well, I think the plants here at Monticello are going to be those that were planted by Thomas Jefferson. So they are all historically accurate. And the bees that are here certainly are doing quite well with the native plants that are um, very prolific. So we, to the best of my knowledge, have not had conversations about asking them to put in certain things because, you know, they really are constrained with the Thomas Jefferson historical accuracy. But it looks as though, from what we can tell, um, it seems to be a very symbiotic relationship. The plants are doing well, the bees are doing well, and uh, there seems to be plenty of um, nectar available for the bees. So uh, it seems to, to go well. But I, I will say this, that um, speaking about flowers, this is something that everyone can do to help the pollinators to plant native uh, plants and flowers that will attract the pollinators and you are providing a source of, um, of food for them. So that's a, a great way that everybody can help and put, put flowers in their gardens. These bees may travel two, two and a half miles to find appropriate foods. Although if given an opportunity, they prefer to go 10 feet away to the shrub because they do have a uh, uh, wind, well, their wings can only go so many miles, hundreds of miles. So yeah, you could go two miles and come back, that's four. And if you had 500 miles, you're not gonna make a lot of trips. So that's, that's another issue that happens. So if they have something in the region, we'll find it. Also though, as we talk about those swarms, visualize them moving about a, a mile a year. Well, we've had swarms we didn't even know about that have taken off and presumably some of them have made it and they swarm every year from trees. So I think that this whole region on the Southwest mountains is uh, inundated with Russian bees. So. That's great. Um, we also have a viewer question about beeswax. So um, what is done with the beeswax? Um, is it sold? Is it made candles? You know, do we make candles with it? What can you tell us a little bit about the beeswax? I'll be glad to, to take that one. Um, the beeswax is created by the bees. They are going to secrete uh, the wax from their, their glands. 
And the beeswax actually is a building material. So they are using this to construct the honeycomb, the comb in the hive, and the comb itself is used uh, for many, many purposes. This provides the um, uh, pantry, the little repository for the nectar to be turned into honey. And then they use the beeswax to cap those cells. It's also the little cells where they're going to store the pollen that they need and the cells where the queen will be laying the eggs. So it's a multifunctional, this honeycomb is very multifunctional and that's all created by the beeswax. And uh, once we harvest the honey, the, uh, the wax uh, certainly can be, that we, the wax that we're cutting off of the, the frames, the capping, uh, can certainly be created, uh, processed for use as candles, as lip balm, as for many, many different sources. And that is certainly done by, by Monticello. But it does speak to the historical um, nature of beekeeping, that it was the bees' wax that was as important, if not more important for, for centuries, uh, even more important than the honey itself, because the candles were so important. The sealing wax was important. So many monasteries had the apiaries specifically for the beeswax. So uh, it's still popular today, used in many, many ways, but um, it certainly harkens back to historical times as well. Well, thank you. I think we have time for one more question here, um, and I'm gonna end it with this. So is it hard to become a beekeeper? And if I want to do it, which I would love to, where do I start and how do I learn? Uh, we've had volunteers um, because of that. I've, I've suggested people help us watch what we're doing to learn a lot about what's entailed in, in becoming a beekeeper. There's also the Central Virginia Beekeepers in conjunction with the county Albemarle County and I think Charlottesville also um, sponsor training programs. And I can assure you, if you took that program, you would knock off two years of mistakes by doing that. It's definitely worthwhile. And uh, it's also a hurdle. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. But, you know, plant some flowers right. <laughs> instead. Exactly. Yeah. Um, beekeeping is a phenomenally rewarding experience. And it, it can be a, a Zen experience, just learning about the wonder of the bees, working with them. It is good exercise, you're out in the fresh air and you get a tremendous sense of satisfaction and you're constantly learning. So it is very rewarding. However, I think people do need to understand that it is very physically demanding. It is year round and it does require a lot of lifting and hauling and carrying and manual labor and you are in July in a bee suit. So it is not glamorous. The scenes that you see on TV where someone is just lifting a frame looks very romantic and that really is um, not entirely accurate. That, that is one 1% uh, of beekeeping time. Otherwise you're, you're strong and you're lifting. But I think that working with a beekeeper, if you're interested in doing it, suit up, find a, a beekeeper and, and offer to help and see what's involved. And then if you want to embrace it, as Paul says, take a beekeeping class through, a, there are many, many different sources, learn everything you can, and then go into it with, uh, with fresh eyes, with a good understanding of what it involves, because it really is a very, very rewarding experience. And, and uh, we both thoroughly enjoy it. And, there's one other thing about it. If, if they help us, um, they get to see a lot of different hives. If you start with one hive, you can't tell whether or not it's average, above average, or about ready to crash. If you have two, you don't know whether one is above average or average, and the other one's gonna crash or vice versa. Uh, so I think that it's important to, to see multiples because you learn a lot more very quickly, so. 
Well, thank you. This has been a fascinating discussion. Um, thank you to our viewers at home for joining us. I just want to extend a huge thank you to Paul and Leslie, not only for being here today, but for all their efforts with beekeeping. As they mentioned, it's a volunteer endeavor, and they have put so much time into it, not only to help Monticello, but to help the local community. So just a big thank you to you. Um, again, thanks for joining us. Join us here next week, next Tuesday. We'll be doing another live stream at 1 p.m. kicking off the um, or talking about wine, Jefferson and wine. Uh, so please join us next week. Thanks. <laughs>